Good morning, everybody. Okay, so a couple of announcements before we get started. Um, one is there are still some extra credit things that I'm working on, but I think I have done all of the midterm one regrades. If I missed yours, sorry, it was an accident. Please just send me a reminder. I don't think so, though. I think I've gotten all of them. Um, as everybody is uh, no doubt aware, our midterm is Friday. So what we're going to do is try to finish up the sort of new material that we need to cover for the midterm today. And if everything goes well, hopefully next time we'll just be a little bit of review, sort of recapping what's going to be on this exam and uh, some applications of NMR. So let's try to get through this stuff today. Um, does anybody have any questions about last time before we go on? All right, cool. Yes? So we know how to like, write the term symbols, but not in terms of like, uh, lambda, pi, lambda. Do we just have to know how to get it information from the term symbol for uh, cytosymmetric molecules? Well, so the only term symbols that I, I'm really going to explicitly ask you to write down on this exam are for diatomic molecules. So that's. That's about it. So we reviewed it in the atomic case just because I wanted to make sure everyone remembers from last quarter because it's, it's really analogous to that. But we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. It takes, it, the, for the atomic ones, it takes a lot of time to write it down. And um, we, you know, it's just not the main emphasis. So for the, you know, the diatomic molecules, you should be able to do stuff like use your general chemistry knowledge and write a molecular orbital diagram and then you know, use that to to generate these things and be able to, to use the information that's contained in those term symbols and make conclusions about it. <coughs> yes? Uh, so for the midterm, the material will start from the, the last of the class just before the midterm, right? The one with the IR selection rules? That's right. So there's going to be a whole bunch of selection rules and Frank Condon factors and deciding <coughs> you know, which transitions happen and what the intensities of different transitions are and how to interpret spectra. So one thing that showed up on the, the practice midterm that we didn't see the first time is spectra, you know, looking at spectra and being able to, to read things off of them and learn some information about the molecule. And the fact that that didn't show up last time should tell you something that uh, you know, probably you're going to see it again. So we did you know, sort of so rotational and vibrational spectroscopy, you know, especially IR and Raman, we did sort of leave off talking about that you know, before the last midterm. So that stuff will be on there. Again, lots of selection rules and also some, uh, some NMR. And again, the, the NMR questions will be sort of two types. One is using the matrix representations of different things that we've been learning about. You know, at a basic level, we're not going to do anything super advanced. Um, and also being able to predict spectra of molecules and explain what they look like. I'm not going to give you a structure of some extremely, or I'm not going to give you a really complex spectrum and expect you to generate the structure of some organic molecule. It's going to be the other way. We're going to look at the molecule and predict what the spectrum looks like, because that's really the emphasis in PCAM. I want you to understand the spectroscopy. OK, so last time we left off talking about T1. And somebody asked a really good question at the end of class last time about does this relaxation time affect the line width? And it doesn't. That's the relaxation in the xy plane, which is called T2. So let's review a little bit what's going on with T1, and then we will talk about the difference between that and T2. OK, so T1 is the longitudinal relaxation time. This is the time that it takes after you flip your spins down into the xy plane. This is how long it takes them to come back along z and return to equilibrium. And so we ended up last time talking about the inversion recovery experiment. So this is the experiment that we use to measure T1. So we flip our spins down, and then we do an arrayed experiment where we wait a little bit of time at the beginning at 0, and then we pulse back into the xy plane and detect. And then the second time we do the experiment, we wait a little bit longer. So the magnetization has a little bit more time to relax. And so the amplitude is smaller. And again, what we see when we do this as a function of time with, with longer and longer delays in there 
is that we start with all the magnetization negative, and then it comes back up and goes through zero, and then levels off to the equilibrium value. And this is different for different nuclei depending on their local chemical environment. And the reason for this is that in order to come back to equilibrium, the nuclei have to experience local changes in the magnetic field. You know, they, they have to give back some energy to their environment somehow. And that's why T1 is also sometimes called spin lattice relaxation. So, you know, we're, we're giving back some energy to the, the bath and uh, coming back to equilibrium. Okay, so here's, a, here's an application of that that was done as a collaboration between my lab and Professor Shaka's lab. So if you have an organic molecule where some of the, the carbons have a, have a really long T1 because they're not attached to any protons. So you know, here we only have one non-protonated carbon. That's, uh, that's number one here. We can see that it takes a lot longer to relax than the other ones. It's the, the little tiny one that uh, that's labeled C1 in both the, the structure and the spectrum. What do we do if we have a sample and we really want to get the structure of it and it has a lot of quaternary carbons that are hard to, to see the signals of? It's really hard to uh, overestimate how much this wastes your time because when we do an NMR pulse sequence, the whole pulse sequence that we're doing takes you know milliseconds. It's not, it's not really that long but then we have to wait several seconds to maybe minutes or even longer in the case of these, these carbons that have a long relaxation time. So we're wasting most of our instrument time just sitting around, and there are different ways to deal with that. Here's one that we came up with. So in this case, we have, instead of uh, our normal five millimeter NMR tube that's about this long, it has the same diameter and everything, but it's more like five feet long and there's a lot of sample in there. And so then inside the probe, there's a stepper motor that moves the sample up and down, and it's all filled with the same sample. But in between the pulses, as we're, as we're signal averaging, we move the sample up and down so that each pulse happens on a different part of the sample. So in other words, we're beating the relaxation time by not pulsing on the same physical sample for different scans of the experiment. So, you know, we pulse on some region of the sample, it's in our coil, and then when we go to take the next scan, the sample gets moved up and we pulse on a different part of it. Then it gets moved up again, we pulse on a different part of it. And by the time it comes back down, the, the uh, long relaxing C13s have hopefully already relaxed. So that's, uh, that's one way that we can make use of building different probe technology to, to beat some NMR parameters that are otherwise problematic. And so here's what that looks like. So we get, um, for this molecule, we can see, um, you know, for the, the stationary tube, we have recycle delays. That's the delay in between scans. So like I pulse down into the XY plane and then wait in the top case a quarter of a second before pulsing back, and then one second in the middle one, and four seconds in the bottom one. And you can see that the signal isn't very strong in these cases, because even if I wait four seconds, the signal hasn't relaxed all the way back to equilibrium before I add it up. Whereas in the case of the moving tube, the very bottom one, we're pulsing on a different sample every time, and so stuff has plenty of time to relax. So hopefully that illustrates the, the idea. If you can see you know, how we can try to manipulate this stuff, then you understand uh, where it comes from. OK, so now let's talk about T2. So this is a different phenomenon. So T1 has to do with the magnetization being in the xy plane, and then it relaxes back to equilibrium by giving some energy to the environment. T2 happens in the xy plane. It's dephasing. So our spin states get out of phase in the xy plane, but there's no energy transfer involved in T2. And this is what determines the line width. And so here's a, here's a good illustration of this. When we give our 90 degree pulse 
all the spins in the sample are aligned along Z, at least to first approximation, or you know, when we're looking at this in terms of the bulk magnetization vector. And then we pulse into the XY plane, but they have different resonant frequencies because they have different chemical shifts, and so they're going to fan out. So they don't stay, you know, as they process, they don't stay together. They're going to process at different rates and, and spread out. This can happen for a number of reasons. So one is, is chemical shift, as I said. Another one could be local inhomogeneities in the sample. So we can see things that, that look like differences in chemical shift, but they're actually due to just differences in the local magnetic environment due to, you know, your sample is a funny shape. It's filled with little granules that are not uniform. And things like that can really affect the, the measured line width. And so often it's important to determine, you know, okay, what's the real T2? What's the fundamental line width of the sample separate from things like what kind of an environment is it in? Is it made up of a bunch of little granules that have different magnetic susceptibilities, you know, at, at boundaries? And so here's what the, the functional form of this thing looks like. It's, it's also just an exponential decay, but this is the dephasing that occurs in the XY plane, and that tells us the line width. Okay, so now how do we measure T2? So you might think from, you know, I've just said that it's the, it's the exponential decay parameter that determines the, the line width of the, our <coughs> Fourier transform signal in time domain. So you might think a good way to measure it is to just either, you know, measure the FID and then fit it and find the, the decay constant of that exponential, or you could imagine that we just Fourier transform the spectrum and get a line width and measure that line width, and that would tell us T2. And if experimentally everything were perfect, that would work really well. But it doesn't, because as I said, there are all sorts of other effects, like maybe your magnetic field isn't as homogeneous as you think it is, or maybe your sample is in a whole bunch of little granules that, that give some you know, kind of differences in local magnetic field that have nothing to do with the chemical composition of the sample. And so in order to do that, we need to use a pulse sequence called the spin echo. So the spin echo refocuses everything in the XY plane. And so you can imagine that, um, you know, you have your spins pulse down to the XY plane and then they spread out and they're going all around in different directions. And then we wait some amount of time here. It's called tau over two. So they fan out and then we give a 180 degree pulse. So that reverses the fast ones and the slow ones. And so then, we wait the same amount of time and they come back. And at that point, everything is refocused and we can measure the signal. And if we repeat that a bunch of times, that tells us the actual T2 of the sample. So, you know, you can, you can think about this as like, as like a race. You know, the, the starting gun goes off and the runners take off and the ones that are really fast get way out in front and then the ones that are kind of slower you are in the middle and then, you know, the lazy ones are just kind of walking along. And then if you have another starting gun and then everybody has to turn around and come back, if they go the same pace, they're all going to get to the, the finish line at the same time, even though some went farther than others. Spin Echo does exactly that and it enables us to separate effects of local, you know, issues with homogeneity of the sample or homogeneity of the magnetic field from the actual spin-spin relaxation. Is there a reason you can't do spin echo for the, um, the spin lattice, something like that, that would make it? Well, it's a, it's a totally different phenomenon, right? So, so the spin lattice relaxation goes this way, and the spin-spin relaxation is in the XY plane. So they're, they're different things. So the spin echo doesn't really tell you about that. So the, the way we measure that is with the inversion recovery. So we put the signal, the magnetization down and then do an arrayed experiment and wait for it to come back up. So the, the T1, the, the longitudinal relaxation, is an energy transfer process. So that's how, you know, we've said, okay, in our pulsed NMR experiment, the system doesn't spew out a photon. It has to, it has to release the energy in other ways. That's how it does it. It's bumping into things and in, interacting with little dipoles locally and releasing that energy. The, the 
transverse relaxation, or T2, is just dephasing. These, these things get out of phase with each other, and it's not an energy transfer process. So they are, they are quite different phenomena. OK, so let's get back to our sort of practical picture of NMR, and we're going to tie it into the, the quantum mechanics again at the end. So we've talked about different properties of an NMR spectrum that can tell us something about your molecule. So we had the number of NMR signals in the spectrum, you know, so the number of inequivalent protons if it's a proton spectrum. We also talked about the different intensities of them, which again, you have to be careful if you're talking about something other than protons. It might not be perfectly quantitative, but it, it pre it's pretty good in the case of protons. Now we have another couple of parameters that we didn't know about before that can tell us something about the sample, T1 and T2. And in fact, those do get used pretty often to, uh, to tell us things about not only molecular motion, but also molecular structure. So let's uh, move on to the, the last uh, major parameter that we can use to get something about the, the spectrum, at least in the case of a spin one half nucleus, and that is the spin-spin splitting. So here's an example of a spectrum that has some splitting going on. And here the resonance has a pattern that tells you something about what's going on with its neighbors. And so let's just review the, the rules about this in kind of a qualitative way before we get into how it works. OK, so if you have equivalent protons, they don't split each other's signals. So if you have, say, a methyl group and it's not near any other protons, it's just isolated, then you just get one peak. They don't split each other. If you have some set of n non-equivalent protons, that's going to split its neighbor into n plus 1 peaks. And for protons, we see the splitting if they're not equivalent and they're on the same carbon or adjacent carbons. If they're farther away from that, usually the coupling is too weak to see. OK, so now imagine that um, I have a C13 labeled sample. So all of my carbons are C13 labeled. C13 is a spin 1 half, and protons are spin 1 half. In all of these spectra that you look at in organic chemistry, we talk about the splitting between the, pro the, the protons and nearby protons. But we also know that C13 is a reasonable NMR nucleus. And it's 1% natural abundance. But that is enough that you should be able to see some of it. So why don't you see splittings between the proton and the carbon? Anybody know? Yeah. That's not exactly right. So you, you can see, so the, the quantity is low. Like you have C13 at natural abundance, it's 1%. It turns out that for most small molecules, that is plenty. You should be able to see it. The reason that you don't see the splittings is that the carbon is actually decoupled from the proton as part of the pulse sequence when you do the experiment. And I think it's really important to point this out because nobody tells you this when you learn about these things in, in sort of the, the practical context. So if you don't want to see splittings from C13 in your proton spectrum, what you do is, instead of just having that simple experiment where you apply a pulse to protons and then wait and detect their signal, while you're detecting on the proton, you apply a high power RF field to the carbon to just scramble its magnetization. So instead of being able to interact with the, the protons during that acquisition period, the carbon is just moving around, the, the, the signal is moving around in spin space in a randomized way, and you're not seeing it. There are lots and lots of different ways to do that. So what I've described is continuous wave decoupling. You just apply a pretty high field to the, the carbon magnetization and scramble it. There are lots and lots of symmetry-based methods that are smarter than that that enable you to get better decoupling for lower RF power. We don't have time to talk about them. But I do want you to, to remember that we, do, that we have to have decoupling in order to get reasonable spectra 
of these things you know, without seeing all kinds of splitting. It's also a useful tool at times to be able to, you know, say, turn off the decoupling during a situation that where you would actually find some utility in seeing the coupling between the C13 and the proton. And you can do that. You can control all of these things experimentally. OK, so if we're back to talking about protons, you know, again, J coupling is, is through bond. We don't usually see splitting between protons that are separated by more than three sigma bonds. And that's just because the, the J coupling here is very weak. So that's why we get the rule that the splitting is uh, between protons on the same carbon and, and on adjacent carbons. And you know, again, they have to be non-equivalent. So it's, it's relatively rare that we have non-equivalent protons on the same carbon, but it can happen. If you have a rigid structure where things are not moving around in a flexible way, like if you have a ring structure, for instance, and there are two protons that, are, that have different chemical environments, you can have non-equivalent protons on the same carbon. OK, so now let's look at the, the splitting patterns here. So if we have a proton and it has one neighbor, that's not equivalent, it's going to be split into a doublet. Why? Because if I'm sitting at that proton and it has one neighbor, it can either be up or down. And depending on whether, it's, whether the neighbor is up or down, it's going to be adding to or subtracting from the main magnetic field. And that gives me a little bit of a difference in the, uh, the frequency. If we have two non-equivalent neighbors, there's uh, it gets split into three peaks, and also the intensities are not equal anymore. We have uh, a triplet that has intensity one to two to one. Why? Again, it has uh, now it has two neighbors. They can either both be up or both be down, and those are the little peaks on either side. And then in the middle, you can have one up and one down, but you can do it in two ways. So it adds up constructively in the middle, and that's why that peak is larger. So then moving on, if we have three neighbors, the signal that we're looking at is going to be split into a quartet. And again, same argument. You can have all three down, all three up. And then there are various ways to have you know, two down and one up. And so that explains the, why the splitting patterns look that way in uh, these spectra that you're used to looking at in organic chemistry. OK, so one more thing to tie this together. You may have also seen these things where the peaks lean toward the group that it's, uh, that it's adjacent to. Have you, have you heard that uh, sort of as a heuristic to, to use to, look, to interpret these spectra, where you have you know, differences in intensity and they're not, they're not, uh, you know, they're not exactly one to two to one or, or whatever you would expect? The reason for that is that the splittings are not quite equivalent. You get things with, um, or it's, I'm sorry, this, it's not that the splittings aren't equivalent. Those are equivalent. The energy of these different states is not exactly equivalent. So you know, all up is a little bit lower energy than all down. And so that's why you see these differences in the intensities. OK, so we have hopefully tied all of this practical stuff into you know, thinking about what the actual spin states are doing and how that's affecting the local environment of each of these protons. Let's look at what that looks like. OK, so this is called the product basis. So now we have, instead of just, you know, we've talked about looking at individual spins. And our eigenstates there are alpha and beta. Now let's talk about the case where we have two coupled spins. And so our overall wave function is going to be a linear combination of these coupled spins. We can have alpha, alpha, beta, beta, alpha, beta, and beta, alpha. And the notation that you'll see is if these spins are really far apart in chemical shift, They'll be called A and X. 
And if they're close together in chemical shift, they'll be called A and B. That's just notation, but we will see it, so it's, it's important to, to recognize. OK, so if you have no field, then all of these states are all on top of each other. They have the same energy. And then if we add a magnetic field, we have to take into account the splitting for the Zeeman interaction of I1, so the first spin. And then there's also the Zeeman interaction for I2, so these things get split again. And then, you know, again, as I mentioned, these levels get shifted up and down according to the J coupling. And as I said, they're not exactly equal, which is why we see um, some differences in these lines. So this is the same thing that we've already said with the kind of conceptual picture pointing fingers up and down. This is how we write it down in quantum mechanical terms, but exactly the same concept. Okay, so now if we write this in terms of the Hamiltonian, it has a J-coupling term. So our, this is our Zeeman Hamiltonian again. So we have an omega naught for I1 and I2 times the respective uh, Z spin operator for each one. So those are just the, the independent Zeeman Hamiltonians for our two spins. You'll also see these called I and S in the literature instead of I1 and I2. And then we have this J coupling term that's also in terms of a product of two IZ operators for each of the spins. And so if we apply the Hamiltonian to these coupled spin states, we get essentially a, an energy. We can refer, you know, obviously it's, uh, the eigenvalue of it is going to be an energy because it's a, it's a Hamiltonian. But we can look at it in frequency terms because that's what we're going to measure in the NMR spectrum. Just have to remember that E equals H nu and then convert to omega. It's the angular frequency. We're going to have these four different frequencies that we see in where the peaks show up that result in or that result from whether you're adding or subtracting the two different resonant frequencies of the original nuclei that we're looking at and the J coupling. And so we have all kinds of different combinations of adding and subtracting this. Okay, so I don't expect you to memorize this at this point, you know, as far as keeping all the signs straight. I do expect you to understand it and be able to, to tie this back together to, you know, what, what this means as a physical picture. So, you know, for instance, if I gave you this, I might want you to draw a spectrum of these two coupled spins and point to where the different peaks are, for instance. That's, uh, that's something that, that might be a reasonable thing to know how to do. So it's, uh, it's important to be able to, to make the connection between the practical stuff that we all already know and how we write it down in quantum mechanical terms. OK, so let's go back to what stuff looks like in the product basis. So we already looked at this in terms of the, the spin states, but let's check out the spectra again. OK, so we have, if we have a proton that has no coupled hydrogens, it's going to have a singlet. Unless, of course, I turn the C13 decoupling off, and then it's going to be a doublet. So here's another uh, fact about this stuff. The J coupling between the carbon and the proton are going to be a little weaker than between the, the protons. And so you know, we won't see necessarily as many couplings to, to carbons. Like we'll, we'll usually just see the directly bonded carbon if we have a non-decoupled 
spectrum. Okay, so now in the next picture we have one coupled hydrogen, so that gives us a doublet. And again, if we turned off the C13 decoupling, we would get a doublet of doublets. We would have a, a splitting for the, the two protons and then each one would be split by the value for the, the carbon. So for two coupled hydrogens, we get the triplet with uh, the pattern of intensities that, that we talked about and et cetera. So one of the important things as far as figuring out uh, what these spectra are telling you is being able to interpret the pattern of intensities in terms of the different spin states. Okay. So, yeah. Does the C13, if we were to have it not decoupled, would it do the splitting come first or second? That's a really good question. So the, the question is if your C13 isn't decoupled, would, would you take that into account before or after the other one? The answer is if you're trying to draw these spectra, you would have to know the values of the J couplings to draw them, and you draw the one that's bigger first and then split the, the little one based on that. So it would depend on the actual values. Yeah? Uh, when you have one couple of hydrogens and you have two hydrogens, why don't you have three, like, why, why don't you have three signals, like one, one like this, one like this, and then one like this? Okay, which, which case are you talking about? When there's two peaks with one couple of hydrogens? Yep. Well, so the, the, you're detecting the one hydrogen, right. and it has one neighbor, right? And its neighbor can either be up or down. And so it has one peak for, the, for interacting with the up state of the neighbor and one peak for interacting with the down state of the neighbor. So wouldn't one peak be lower depending on which one is the, the first the hydrogen that you're looking at is um, Right, so that's what I was saying. When you have the peaks leaning toward, so that's why, because you have very small differences in energy. You can't always see them. They're really, really small. Like all of these things have small energy differences anyway. So, so you can't always see it, but sometimes you do. Okay, so let's look at um, some equivalent spins in some cases where, you know, as, as we just talked about, what happens when you have two different J couplings? Which one do you apply first? Okay, so here's a molecule that's kind of rigid and it has, uh, in equivalent, it, it has the possibility to have inequivalent hydrogens on the same carbon. Okay, so in the first case, there aren't any coupled hydrogens, so that's a singlet, that's easy. The second one is a doublet. Again, that's easy, you only have one inequivalent proton on the adjacent carbon. But then if we look at the third one, we have the blue one and the red one, and here that's, uh, it looks like that's the, the larger coupling. But then we also have this interaction with the green one. And so we split, we split the signal into the larger doublet or the, the uh, doublet that's further apart. And then the smaller coupling comes in as a little splitting on top of each of those. And so it's important to be able to tell the difference between a doublet of doublets, which is what this is, and a quartet. And of course, you tell the difference by looking at the intensities. So here, they're all the same size. And for a quartet, you have this one to two to two to one intensity ratio. And so that's something that gives you an important clue when you're trying to figure out what kind of molecule you're looking at by using the NMR spectrum. Okay, so we can take this one step further if we have uh, you know, one more proton that splits these things and is inequivalent then that one, you know, here it's, it's clear that the coupling is going to be smaller because it's, it's another bond away. And so that splits each, each of these things further. So you just keep, you know, apply the largest coupling first and then keep going with this branching pattern. And again, the relative intensities of the lines tell you a lot about how things are connected. So here's, a, here's again, a, a pictorial representation of that. If we have the, the methyl group, question? Um, going back to the previous slide, why is the coupling to HB smaller than the coupling to HA? Um, I don't know. It just is. That's how it works for this molecule. You would have to, um, if you have, if you have a, a, a situation where it's farther away, then you can definitely predict that it's going to be smaller. Otherwise, um, there are a bunch of rules that, that can help you predict what, which couplings are going to be smaller than what. For purposes of this class right now, I would just probably just tell you the coupling values. 
you know, some of them are, are larger than others, and, and it's not, you know, predicting which ones are which from looking at the structure is kind of beyond the scope of what we're doing right now. You know, other than if it's farther away, obviously it's going to be a smaller coupling. Okay, so again, here's a, here's a good pictorial representation of the case where we just have one neighbor and this, you know, this tiny little arrow pointing uh, with and against the main magnetic field is that little, you're seeing the neighbor as a spin up or spin down and adding to and subtracting from it. Okay. Other things that, that we should mention, this is, uh, we've covered most of this, but I stuck this in here because I wanted to make sure to point out that coupled spins always have the same coupling constant. So if we have two sets of signals, like so say we have that, that one proton that's next to the methyl group, the, you know, the, the one proton is going to be split into a quartet and the methyl group is going to be split into a doublet, but the spacing in between those is going to be this, exactly the same value because you know, those things are coupled to each other, they have the same coupling constant. So that's also an, a nice uh, clue when you're using these spectra to interpret you know, and find out the signal of a molecule, find out the structure of a molecule. <coughs> things that are coupled to each other are always going to have the same coupling value. And you know, coming back to your question of how do you know which, which J coupling is which, here's a table of sort of some standard values of what these coupling constants might be. Um, there are some theoretical treatments of this. Um, Gaussian is pretty good for calculating NMR parameters and you, know, you can calculate these things. The physics is pretty well understood. Um, also sort of in parallel with calculating it, people have just measured vast tables of information. You know, organic chemists over many years have compiled just a bunch of tables of different compounds and what their couplings are. And so we have both of these sources of information to draw on about what coupling constants are. Again, for, um, for purposes of PCHEM, I will give you values of J couplings that I want you to do something with. It's, uh, it's kind of beyond the scope of what we're doing. Okay, so you should be able to, to look at spectra and you know, tell me why they look the way they do. You should be able to take a molecule and draw its NMR spectrum, including, you know, if I say what happens if we turn the carbon decoupling off, then what does it look like? You should be able to deal with that too. You might see nuclei for things other than, that are things other than proton and carbon. So you should be able to, to be prepared for that. And you saw some examples in the homework where there are different types of nuclei other than protons and carbon. The principles are the same. So NMR is pretty versatile. We can do this with uh, anything that has a, a nuclear spin. Other things that are spin one half nuclei are you know, N15, um, phosphorus 31. There are lots of these things around. Also, there are quadrupolar nuclei that have more spin states, you know, more than just uh, plus and minus one half. And we may have to deal with those. Okay, so here are some more complicated splitting patterns. So if we look at something like nitrobenzene, you know, here H, HB and HC just have one set of neighbors, whereas HA is split by two equivalent, two inequivalent sets of protons. And so you should be able to look at something like this and be able to generate the correct splitting patterns and, um, you know, explain why they look the way they do. You should also be able to, to use symmetry to determine that, you know, the protons on either side of the, the benzene ring, if we take a plane, you know, this way through the molecule are the same. And again, don't forget the difference between a quartet and a doublet of doublets. They mean very different things in terms of what the, the proton is adjacent to, and you can tell by looking at the intensities. So the quartet has different intensities. That's one way, thing that's, that's different about it. But if you look closely, it also has a different splitting pattern. So in the quartet, the, the splitting between the peaks is the same in every case because it's, it's based on a single J coupling, whereas the, double of, the doublet of doublets has two different values. 
here's another example, example of a doublet of doublets. So proton C there has two different coupling values. So you should be able to, to generate things like this for molecules of uh, about this complexity, maybe a little bit harder. And you should be able to get the, uh, the splitting patterns right. Okay, and again, um, so that's, that's what I want to say about proton NMR. It does apply to all kinds of other nuclei that we might want to look at. Again, you will also see C13 spectra. The main difference here is that, uh, for one thing, the chemical shift range is much larger. So for protons, everything happens about in a range of about 0 to 12 ppm. For carbon, it's more like 0 to 200. There are other things that have much larger differences in chemical shift. So why, what makes protons have a tiny chemical shift range and C13 has a much larger one? It's polarizability of the electron cloud. So a proton just has two electrons around it at most, and it doesn't have much opportunity to have chemical shift anisotropy or differences in the local magnetic field, whereas C13 has a lot more electrons around it. Its electron cloud is more polarizable. We get a larger chemical shift range. From that, you would expect that something like xenon, which is also a good spin one half nucleus, would have a huge chemical shift range because it has a really big polarizable electron cloud. And you'd be right, it does. And that's, uh, that's something that people take advantage of in some applications, particularly in imaging things like lung tissue and void space where it would otherwise be hard to, uh, to image. OK, so now let's talk about some applications of, of NMR. So what we've gotten to so far covers pretty much what I expect you to deal with for this exam. And we're going to talk about some applications. OK, so in the context of measuring T1 and T2, we've talked about arrayed experiments. And so we've already seen the concept where we have an experiment and we have some time delay that we're going to increment and make it longer and longer and longer each time we do the experiment. In NMR, it turns out that we can do this in a, a more coordinated way and Fourier transform the result and get a two-dimensional NMR spectrum. So let me explain what I mean by that. So here is the, the very simplest two-dimensional NMR exp uh, experiment. It's called COSY, correlation spectroscopy. And if we look at the last pulse here, the blue one, and the free induction decay, that's our normal one-pulse NMR experiment. So if we just did that part of the, the sequence, we would see just a 1D spectrum. And so each one of these free induction decays in this picture represents just that part of the experiment. OK, so now what happens if I put another pulse and a delay in front of it? So if we look at the pink one, if I have a 90 degree pulse and then I don't wait any time and I do another 90 degree pulse, I'm just going to put the magnetization along 0 and I'm not going to see anything for the first point when I detect it, right? But then if we step through this and wait a little bit more time, we're going to see some signal and this is going to grow in. And if we look at the, um, the free induction decay that we see, we have, um, you know, as, as we array that delay, we see that the, amp that, that the starting amplitude of the FID that we get in what's called the direct dimension, that's the part that we're directly measuring with the last pulse, that's going to be modulated in a periodic fashion as a result of the delay because we're going we're gonna to have, you know, anything from you do a 90 degree pulse and then another one and see no signal all the way to, you know, we let it relax and then, and then uh, to a point where it's going to be at an optimal point for detection. And that will be an oscillatory signal in the indirect dimension. And so then what we can do is Fourier transform these things in two dimensions and we get information about what spins are correlated to each other. And a typical you know, thing that we might use to correlate them would be J-coupling. So now we've learned about how they're, they're coupled by J-coupling. Here's um, 
what something like that might look like. Um, this particular one is correlated through dipolar coupling, but uh, because it's a, it's a solid spectrum, but we see the same kind of thing. So in this case, the, the blue spectrum is uh, C13, and the green one is N15. So notice that we only see the C13s that are coupled to an N15, and vice versa. And you can think about this as a topological map. So we have the FID in both dimensions, and then we Fourier transform it and get peaks. So if we took a slice through either dimension, we would see our normal uh, 1D NMR spectrum you know, coming up this way or going off to the side. And we're looking down on this thing that looks like a mountain range because we have these peaks in two dimensions. And now this looks like a topological map. So everywhere there's a dot, that means that there's a C13 coupled to an N15. Here's what that looks like for a protein. So this is a proton nitrogen HSQC. So everywhere there's a peak, there's a proton coupled to a nitrogen. And all these little annotations on it are annotations indicating which amino acid residue in the protein they belong to. And we can't actually figure that out just by looking at this experiment. It's too complicated. We need to do a lot of three-dimensional experiments where we, we look at interactions among protons and nitrogen and carbon and walk through the protein backbone to assign them. But this is something that's very useful when you're studying proteins and going about trying to get their structures. So what this looks like, um, so, so we have two overlaid spectra here. So the black one is uh, gamma S crystalline. It's a protein that makes up, that's, that's one of the structural proteins of our eye lenses. This is something that, that we work on in my group. And there's also um, a mutant of this protein, which is G18V. That means uh, the glycine in position 18 gets mutated to valine. And we're interested in this in my lab because this is a point mutation that causes a disease. If you're born with this mutation, you get cataracts at age six. And so we're interested in learning about how is the mutant protein different from the wild type. And so multidimensional NMR spectra really tell us a lot about that. So here are some annotations indicating where different peaks corresponding to different residues in the wild type move around in the mutant protein. And by doing a lot of these different kinds of multidimensional spectra, <clears throat> we can build up a picture of the whole protein. So the first step is we have to assign it. We can, you know, we have to get an address for every proton, carbon, and nitrogen in the protein by following along the, the backbone through various uh, multidimensional experiments. So, you know, 2D experiments don't do it. We need three-dimensional experiments. So for instance, we could have like proton, carbon, nitrogen as the third dimension, and then we get a cube that has these spheres of intensity in it. And we can use that to, to map out where things are. And then in the end, we can use that to get the structure. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that next time. And we're also going to do a little bit of review for the exam. See you on Wednesday.